It's the most wonderful time of the year, Black History Month, a joyous occasion when we all come together to celebrate the men and women of color who make our society a better, safer place each and every day. And when it comes to iconic black role models, very few come close to touching the legacy and influence of Mabel Medea Simmons. Originally created and portrayed by Tyler Perry in his series of traveling stage plays, Medea rose to prominence with a breakout role in the 2005 hit film Diary of a Mad Black Woman, which earned nearly 10 times its budget in box office revenue and an extremely rare a cinema score from the viewing audience. This massive success led to a cinematic universe to rival the best of them, with Medea appearing in 12 theatrical films, one animated feature, and a number of television episodes. And now, I'm going to rank and review every single one. As always, I'll be rating these movies based on three criteria. Medea hijinks, Medea performance, and overall movie quality. And now, without further ado, man, let's take a look at Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Now this is probably going to blow your mind, but the title of the film is not referring to Medea. You can imagine the shock and outrage I felt when the movie began and a mad black woman not named Medea started narrating her diary. To look at us, you would think that we've got it all together, but looks can be deceiving. As it turns out, this film, much like many films in the Medea Cinematic Universe, or the MCU as I like to call it, isn't actually about Medea. It's about one of her sexy female relatives getting viciously beaten by her husband. Oh, trigger warning by the way. And I mean that in the pussy sense and not the Chicago alleyway sense. But we'll get to all that later, because now it's time for some Medea hijinks. Medea doesn't appear in the first Medea movie until 15 minutes in, but she makes the most of her entrance. Her granddaughter Helen shows up in the middle of the night after getting violently attacked by her husband. And Medea, being the hardened street tough woman that she is, answers the door with comedic violence. Don't shoot! What the heck? And if you think black on black gun violence is hilarious, you're in luck because Medea is gonna haphazardly wave that bad boy around for the entire movie. After learning about Helen's abusive relationship, Medea's maternal instincts take over, and she becomes driven by an unquenchable thirst for vengeance that will lead to some of the toppest tier Medea hijinks these films will ever see, starting with smashing through the security gate at the abusive husband's mansion, breaking in, and influencing Helen to join her in destroying the designer clothes her husband bought for his mistress. Rip it. Rip it. Rip it. Rip it. The couple comes home, and despite being threatened with a call to the popo, Medea continues to choose violence. That's it. I'm calling the police. I ain't scared of no popo. Call the popo, ho. Call the popo, ho. She then smacks the mistress on the head, finds a chainsaw, and proceeds to cut everything in the house down the middle. This is exactly the kind of hijinks I want to see in a Medea movie. Just pure chaos and destruction all in the form of a fat elderly stereotype. It's an undeniable pleasure to watch. And the fact that it's all over after just seven minutes is a painful reminder that the vast majority of these movies is just soap opera tier relationship drama. Exactly 12 minutes after making her cinematic debut, Medea gets arrested on screen for the first time. But if the future movie titles are to be believed, this won't be the last. At this point, I need to introduce a caveat to our rules here. When it comes to Medea hijinks and Medea performance, you might expect me to only focus on Medea. But in addition to playing Medea, Tyler Perry also portrays her brother Joe and her nephew Brian. 
And for the purposes of this ranking, I think it would be fair to include all characters played by Tyler Perry under the Medea umbrella, since these siblings are two sides of the same elderly racist stereotype coin. Anyway, Medea gets placed under house arrest and is forced to wear an ankle bracelet. So she throws a house party to celebrate. Meanwhile, Joe is smoking some dank kush, and he shares it with a woman who he knows is on lithium. You ain't supposed to smoke this when you don't lift it. I'm all right. All right, don't wet up my butt. Get the <laughs> lipstick all over. Now, I wouldn't expect any of you white boys in the audience to know this, but mixing lithium with Smoky McPlant can lead to life-threatening side effects, including cardiac arrest, seizures, and temporary insanity. Joe knows about these adverse effects, but he tokes her up anyway, and the woman has a complete mental breakdown. I'm out. As if those hijinks weren't wacky enough, Joe then starts taunting the woman's delusions to make her even more upset. No more rabbits. Hey, Mildred, you forgot the rabbit. Unfortunately, that's basically where the hijinks ends for this one. Medea leads a big dance number, and at one point she butters up her ankle to get the bracelet off, but otherwise she doesn't do much beyond giving life advice to the main character. As little as it might have felt, the Medea hijinks we did get was shocking and genuinely funny, so it's gonna be high marks from me. In terms of Medea hijinks, I give this one an 8 out of 10. You might scoff at the concept of measuring the quality of Tyler Perry's performance as Medea, but the character is far more nuanced and complicated than the surface-level offensive caricature might lead you to believe. While the racially inspired quirks of the character are often hilarious and accurate, Medea truly shines when dishing out the types of advice and wisdom that could only come from a woman of great life experience. As the widow of nine husbands, Medea knows better than anyone how abusive and evil men can be, and she inspires the women in her life to stand up for themselves instead of relying on others. And if we're gonna be honest, Tyler Perry's comedic delivery is basically perfect. You don't have to like what he's saying, and you don't even have to find the words funny. But the performance, the flow of his cadence combined with the hand motions, and the head bobs, and the facial expressions. There's a reason why this character became instantly iconic. Did you do this? This is Vera Wang! Who that is? She do nails? I need to get my nails done. My favorite part about the Medea character is that she isn't always played to be funny. There are moments of anger that feel genuine, and that's because the character is based on Tyler Perry's mother. He's not performing as a clown. He's doing a direct imitation of a real-life person, and it does show. Hannah, you bastard, put your hands on him. Oh my god, don't hurt him. Oh, I'm not gonna hurt him, I'm gonna kill him putting his hand on my granddaughter. I'm calling the police. Look. Charles, I have been nothing but a good woman and wife to you. I don't deserve this. Just look at his face here. That might be a man dressed up in drag wearing old lady makeup, but all I see is the pure, unadulterated rage of an elderly woman who just witnessed man's cruelty with her own eyes. And she's seriously considering ending his life. Obviously, I'm not trying to say Tyler Perry was robbed of an Oscar nomination, but considering how bad this performance could have been, the fact that any sense of humanity was added to the character at all is praiseworthy. In terms of Medea performance, I give this one a 9 out of 10. In the beginning, I was shocked that the title wasn't referring to Medea, and in the end, I was shocked that I actually thought this was a good movie. Yes, the movie does have a 16% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, but Tyler Perry doesn't make movies for critics. He makes them for his community. I wasn't kidding earlier when I said this movie got an a cinema score. Only 103 movies in history have gotten an a So while the critics might have hated it, the film's intended audience considered it literally perfect. But I'm not a black person, I'm just a monkey on the internet. So I don't necessarily view the film as perfect, but it was surprisingly much more interesting than I was expecting. In a word, I would describe the film as sadistic. 
Helen narrates about how her 18-year marriage is falling apart, and this comes to a head when her husband decides to move her out and move his mistress in. Helen refuses to leave, so her husband violently drags her out of the house. No! no I am not leaving! You what? No! No! Leave no! You leave him, no! no! right? You leave him. No! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! Okay, so that's all good and fun. But here's where it gets sadistic as fuck. Helen's lawyer husband gets shot by his own client in the courtroom. leading to a coma and the risk of permanent paralysis. The mistress immediately, without even a moment's hesitation, tells the doctor to pull the plug. Should we resuscitate? No. Wait a minute. Excuse me? I'm but Helen ain't having that shit. Much like Gustavo Fring, she wants to keep him alive and wheelchair bound so she can torture him as revenge. And at this point, the film stops being a comedy entirely and becomes a full-on horror show. First, she leaves him helpless and alone in his wheelchair for several days without food. I'm gonna let you sit here for a few days and think about what I've said. When she comes back days later, he's desperate for water. So, she throws him into the bathtub where he desperately tries not to drown! Hey, stop! Stop! Hey, stop! It's genuinely harrowing to watch! Then, she sets him up at the dinner table and eats in front of him while laughing that his mistress whore emptied his bank accounts. So even if he survives, he'll be left with nothing. And the man is weeping! I almost couldn't believe what I was watching, but I was enthralled. And that brings us to one of the major themes of the movie, that being forgiveness. Except the movie is evaluating forgiveness through a Christian lens. And while on the surface these movies seem to be extremely pro-Christianity, this film in particular has a nuanced view on the whole thing. Here's an example. Helen is confiding to her mother about how badly her husband hurt her, both physically and emotionally. And her mom, being a completely brain-dead elderly woman, doesn't give a single fuck about her pain and starts ranting about religion instead. God is your everything. Don't you know he's a jealous god? He don't want no man before him. Clearly not useful, rational, or empathetic advice in any conceivable way. Now let's juxtapose that idiotic statement with what Medea has to say about religion later in the film. God can take care of folks far better than you can. God take too long sometimes. I need to get got right then. This is by far the best message of the movie. And I don't even think it was intentional. Don't waste your time waiting for God to solve your problems. Stand up and do it yourself. Because guess what? He's not coming to help you. According to Pew Research, black people are more likely to be Christian than any other racial group. Which is ironic, considering that both God and Jesus spent centuries lounging around eating popcorn and drinking soda while watching their ancestors get brutally whipped. Hundreds of years of slavery. Hundreds of years of prayer. Hundreds of years of waiting for God to do literally anything. And he didn't. You know who did put in the time and effort to end slavery? White people. Who's your God now? Ultimately, I found Medea's big screen debut to be hilarious, darkly sadistic, and accidentally red-pilled on religion. There was a lot of boring relationship melodrama that helped pad out the runtime, but overall, I was a satisfied viewer. In terms of overall movie quality, I give this one a 7 out of 10, giving it a final score of 24 out of 30. Our next Medea adventure comes in the form of Medea's Family Reunion, released literally less than a year after the original. Evidently, the black community had developed an illness known as Medea Fever, because this film was an even bigger financial success than the previous one. 
That's not me being racist, by the way. While it is true that people of all races were legally permitted to see Medea movies, Tyler Perry himself has stated that approximately 90% of the theater-going audience was black. So don't get it twisted. These movies are made by black people for black people. And according to Tyler Perry, the only thing black audiences want to see more than a man dressed in drag is black women being violently attacked during domestic disputes. <laughs> That's right, the same exact shit happens in this movie. But we'll get to that later. For now, let's dive back into some Medea hijinks. Just like the previous film, Medea doesn't appear until about 15 minutes in. This time around, she's in trouble with the law because she forcibly removed the ankle monitor from the previous movie. And since this is a comedy film, the judge decides to get creative with her punishment. She's given the option between going to prison or adopting a troubled youth. You're her new foster mother. The hell I am? I know who oh, the hell now. It's the reason why God put a woman through menopause. I'm past 60, honey. You know what that means? On the drive home, the adopted girl is giving Medea too much sass, so Medea starts beating her ass. You think I'm playing? Medea, 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 shut up. When Joe meets the adopted girl, he confuses her for his granddaughter. Hey, Brian, hey, uh, Tiffany, how you doing? Daddy, this is not my daughter. Oh, well, here, they all look alike to me. Who is for? As you might expect, Street Tough Medea and Street Tough Orphan Girl butt heads quite a bit. But through measured discipline, motivational speeches, and a couple ass whoopings, Medea eventually earns the girl's respect. The turning point was when the orphan admitted she didn't like going to school because the kids on the bus bully her. So, Medea gets on the bus, threatens the children, and then beats the fuck out of one. Shut up, old lady! <laughs> Speaking of violence against children, there's also a scene where Medea beats the orphan with a belt, so that was pretty funny too. Evidently, the gun-related hijinks fell out of style by this point, because instead of threatening people with a bullet, Medea utilizes her creativity instead, educating this movie's battered housewife on the violent virtues of a boiling pot of grits and the back end of a frying pan. And spoiler alert, but at the end of the movie, the woman does follow through with the advice. And it's by far the most satisfying moment of the film. Must be out your mind. You got me all over this city, walking around. Y'all don't even see where you are. Where do I look at? You? Is everything all right? It's fine, and I know that scream anyway. Come on, let's go to the church. The only other hijinks worth mentioning is Joe's behavior at the titular family reunion. Now, I'm no expert on black culture, so correct me if I'm wrong, but there seems to be nearly a hundred people at this family reunion, so I don't know if all these people are truly related, or if this is a family in the sense that the people of this community refer to each other as brother and sister regardless of actual blood relation. I'm just going to assume that they're all from the same family tree, which makes it especially high jinxical when Joe starts getting horny as fuck. Come here, come here, come here, come here, Uncle Joe. How you doing, baby? <laughs> Listen, I'm a little thirsty. Reach down in that barrel and get me a drink. Good Lord Almighty. <sighs> Deep, baby, deeper, deeper. If this is truly his blood relation, then I am extremely curious to know where Tyler Perry got the inspiration for this character. If Medea is based on his mom, I'm a little worried about what his dad might have been up to. And in case you think I'm grasping at straws here, just you wait. Just. You. Wait. As it turns out, fatherly non-consensual relations is a major theme of the film. But we'll get to that later. In terms of Medea hijinks, I found this one to be lacking compared to the original. Basically, the only hijinks to speak of is violence against children. And while I am a huge fan of the genre, the lack of diverse shenanigans left me disappointed considering Medea's name is actually in the title this time. So I'm gonna give this one a 5 out of 10. 
While the hijinks might be a disappointment, the performance continues to hit all the right notes. Since the plot focuses on Medea mothering a troubled youth, we get way more scenes of Medea giving the maternal advice of an empowered, confident woman. And it's more apparent than ever that Tyler Perry is basing this character on a very real person. Honey, folk gonna talk about you till the day you die, and ain't nothing you can do. Let folks talk, honey. People talk about me. Honey, listen to me. It ain't what people call you, it's what you answer to. Do you hear me? You remember that. And call it sappy or cheesy or whatever you want, but Medea is dishing out some real world wisdom here. Lessons that anybody on Earth could benefit from if taken seriously. My last foster mother, she told me the only thing I'm gonna be smart enough to do is lay on my back. The best revenge you can have on somebody that told you something like that is to prove them wrong. Best revenge you can have is to kick their butt. They have a bad revenge. Comedically, the performance is just as good. But on an emotional level, Tyler Perry is transcending what he did in the previous film. And it's especially impressive considering Tyler Perry also directed this movie, meaning he had to embody his characters while maintaining his director brain at the same time. This is plays around the corner. It's a nice Italian place. That ain't where you're going. You're going to a poetry bar. That's true, we're going to approach the thought That's okay. Read, read the script next time. I know it might be early to make this call, but I'm willing to hold this one up as the gold standard of Medea performances that all other Medea films should aspire to. Which means, in terms of Medea performance, I'm giving this one the coveted 10 out of 10. You better buckle up, buckaroos, cause this one gets fucking crazy! If you thought the senile mother from the original film was bad, the mother in this film is the most evil character I've seen on screen in recent memory. This is by far the most horrific and disgusting plot twist in any comedy movie ever made! And I challenge you to point out something worse in the comment section. Basically, we've got our protagonist Lisa and her fiancé, and his favorite pastime is beating the shit out of her. Lisa confides in her mother about this abuse, except this time, instead of ranting about jealous gods, this mom starts quoting Andrew Tate! He hits me. Well, you must stop doing what you're doing to make him angry. What? Be a good wife. Do what the man says and you won't have any problems. As it turns out, the mom hates the Medea side of her family and considers them to be ghetto trash. She wants her daughter to marry a rich man and move them up the social ladder so badly that she mentally justifies her daughter getting smacked around by her husband. Meanwhile, the fiancé is making it crystal clear that if she tries to leave him, he will kill her. That's the only way you won't leave me. And here's where we get the truly horrific shit. About an hour into the movie, it's revealed that this sick, twisted mother, in a desperate attempt to prevent her husband from abandoning the family, allowed her preteen daughter to be... Uh... Uncle Joe'd by her own father! When she came and she found me, and she put me in the bathtub, and she combed my hair, and she put makeup on. And she said, just relax. And then she let him come in and me. You are gonna tell her! He asked me for you. I had done everything I could for our family, everything I could to please him. If we were gonna be comfortable, I had to make some hard, hard decisions. Again, I implore you, find me a more detestable, outrageous plot point from any other comedy movie. Dr. Strangelove ends with a nuclear holocaust, but at least that had a cowboy riding the bomb on the way down. And since these movies evidently need to include the theme of Christianity-influenced forgiveness, the daughter forgives the bitch. 
She doesn't need forgiveness. She needs an inch of lead poisoning administered directly into her skull. Oh, also, uh, Maya Angelou is in this movie for some reason? But I don't really give a shit because poetry is bad and you shouldn't read it. Ultimately, this film repeated too many plot points from the original, and Tyler Perry's only way to make the same plot interesting again was by including a non-consensual Alabama-style underage copulation. It is absolutely jarring to go from that scene to Uncle Joe farting. But generally, I was entertained and did enjoy the film. In terms of overall movie quality, I'm giving this one a 6 out of 10 giving it a final score of 21 out of 30. The third film in the Medea cinematic universe isn't actually a Medea movie at all. She makes a cameo for about five minutes towards the end of the movie, but that's it. Instead of Medea, the movie hopes you'll fall in love with the wacky new character, Leroy! Brown. And evidently, black audiences did fall in love with Leroy Brown, because this film launched a television series of the same name that went on for 140 episodes. If you think your family is crazy, I'm bringing sexy back. You look like the one who killed it in the first place. Then you better meet the Browns. Woo! <laughs> Nights at 8 on TV 64. Come on now. America's funniest family. I know, right? <laughs> So exciting! Make Meet the Browns a part of your family. <laughs> you know what? That's a really good idea. Weeknight today on TV 64. Fun happens here. As demotivating as it was to sit through one of these movies without cutting back to Medea every 10 minutes, I did fulfill my duty and watch the entire thing. So, as little as it may be, let's evaluate the Medea hijinks. We might only get five minutes of Medea and Joe hijinks, but what we do get is pretty incredible. Medea is in a high-speed chase with a dozen police cruisers in hot pursuit. And according to the news anchor, this has been one of the longest police chases in history. This old woman is driving like she has a lot to lose. Who could this be calling me right now? Hello? Carmen! Hey! How you doing, baby? This is exactly the type of Medea hijinks I like to see. But my favorite joke in this scene, and really my favorite joke in the entire movie, is when Joe pretends to be a feeble old man who was merely kidnapped and then takes off running. She got a gun! She, she kidnapped me! As Medea is getting arrested, she starts beating the shit out of a police officer. And that's a wrap on Medea's screen time. The most baffling thing about this scene is it has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. You could remove this entire scene, and not only would nobody notice, but the movie would flow better. Yes, it is literally the best part of the movie, but it also has no business being in the movie. In terms of Medea hijinks, the quality was good, but the quantity was abysmal. So I'm giving this one a 2 out of 10. The only side of Medea we get to see in this movie is the wacky criminal one. So Tyler Perry doesn't get the opportunity to flex his acting muscles very much. But I will give him this. Comedic timing is often just as impressive as dramatic acting. And that scene of Joe running really did tickle me. So I'll be generous. In terms of Medea performance, I'm also giving this one a 2 out of 10. Mostly because it features the least amount of Medea performance we've seen yet. Now that we're three Medea movies deep, a pattern seems to be emerging. Or perhaps you might call it 
a formula. Basically, every single one of these movies has the same plot. There's a sexy woman related to Medea who has an abusive ex. She then meets a blue collar worker and treats him like shit. In the first movie, he's a mover. In the second movie, he's a bus driver. And in this one, he's a sports recruiter. Like I said, she treats the man like shit, but then keeps running into him. And eventually they fall in love. But uh oh, as soon as the new relationship is going great, the previous guy comes back into the picture. And now, the protagonist has to make the harrowing decision between the perfect dream guy and a wife beater. Golly, what thrilling drama. What mold will Tyler Perry break next? So yeah, not only is this shit getting stale by this point, but now there's not even a Medea running around to entertain us every couple scenes. And Leroy Brown is a piss poor replacement. The only scene of his that I enjoyed was when he talked about stabbing his testicles with a pencil. That ain't funny, I got lead poison on my privacy. The protagonist of this film is a single mom living in the shithole streets of Chicago. And really, the moral of this story seems to be that cities are full of drugs and crime, and the only solution for saving your family is to inherit a two-story house in Georgia. To drive this point home, Tyler Perry decides to have the main character's teenage son get shot in the back by a drug dealer in an alleyway. Yet again, a shocking moment I never expected to see in one of these movies. Black on black gun violence is one of the biggest issues facing Tyler Perry's community. In approximately 90% of all cases, the black victim was killed by a fellow black person. So for Tyler Perry to acknowledge and evaluate this in the film, to me, had the potential of being interesting. Unfortunately, Tyler Perry treats this shooting as a complete farce. And literally five minutes later, the kid is back training for basketball like nothing happened. Am I supposed to believe the love of basketball is enough to heal a bullet wound? I think some urban cemeteries would have a lot more vacancies if that was the case. I don't know how I'm expected to take this drama seriously when the movie itself doesn't even try to. Evidently, 68% of black Americans have experienced gun violence or know somebody who was the victim of gun violence. So Tyler Perry needlessly reminded the majority of his comedy film audience about potentially the most traumatic period of their life just to completely ignore that the scene happened five minutes later. It almost feels malicious. This is the first MCU film that I would consider to be more bad than good. So, in terms of overall movie quality, I'm gonna give this one a 4 out of 10, giving it a final score of 8 out of 30. But, that's all the time we've got today. We're three movies down and an absolute shit ton to go. Stay tuned for the next installment of the Medea Movie Marathon, and if you like the work I do online and you want to support the show, check out patreon.com slash mumkey. I'll see you next time, folks.